Hello and welcome to Useful Idiots. I am one of your hosts, Katie Halper. And I am the other Matt Taibbi. The other Matt Taibbi, not to be confused with... No, I'm the other host. Right, I know. Yeah, yeah. not the other Matt Taibbi. There actually, right. I, I don't think there is another Matt Taibbi that oh, I know of. I wonder if there is. So... Uh, this is Useful Idiots. We have an interesting show this week. We're going to be the only other <laughs> news outlet that's going to pick up a story that had, I think, international significance, but nobody else picked it up because you'll see the reasons right. why um, when we get there. Not surprising. Yeah, not surprising, right? So we're, we're going and we're going to interview a friend of show whom you'll recognize and what else is there anything else that's going to happen in this? well i just want to say a couple of useful idiot bumps this week daniel ellsberg leaked some documents did you see that no yeah emboldened of course we know that without appearing on useful idiots like the pentagon papers are one thing but appearing on useful idiots whole new level right Right. You know, a whole new level of legitimacy. Yeah. Fame. Heft. Fame. Heft. Cred. What is it? Bona fides. Bona fides. Bona fides. Yeah. Yeah. What a, yeah. yeah. I'm going to just say, I'm going to tell you what happened. Top secret plans and presidential decisions not yet declassified to initiate nuclear war against China in defense of Taiwan in 1958 were just revealed by me ah. to the New York Times. Mm -hmm. So he still got it. Well, there, look, there is some clearly something going on with amping up tensions with China. So I guess we're all going to have to learn about that stuff now. So yeah, good timing, right? Yeah. And so that's useful idiots bump number one, useful idiots bump number two, Abby Martin won her her court case. She did. Yeah. And wow, that, of that's... course, was uh, when she basically she sued the state of Georgia for for canceling. Well, OK, she she people should just rewatch this episode or watch it if they haven't. But a federal judge has ruled that Georgia's anti BDS law is unconstitutional. The ruling comes in response to a lawsuit that was filed against the state by journalist Abby Martin. So it's a pretty huge deal. Um, and basically what happened is that Abby Martin was invited to give a talk at a university in Georgia. She was when she got her paperwork, she I mean, she luckily looked at it and it included a promise to not it's like a loyalty oath basically yeah it's basically a loyalty oath a promise not to elevate or, or like you know speak well of bds and then she sued because they have it so that in that state you literally have to to sign said loyalty oath to be able to like for 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 being paid basically it was just a precondition of right. getting paid by the by a state entity i think yeah right yes. for certain for contracts above a certain amount of money on March 21st, District Court Judge Mark Cohen blocked the state's attempt to dismiss the lawsuit. Cohen's 29-page decision asserts that the Georgia law, quote, prohibits inherently expressive conduct protected by the First Amendment, burdens Martin's right to free speech, and is not narrowly tailored to further a, a substantial state interest. Okay, great. Yeah. 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 Good job. So Good clear, job. Clear, clearly. Uh, good job, useful idiots. Yeah. Good job, us. You're welcome, world. We, by the way, now we just need Abby to come on and... We need to trick. We're going to invite her on again. You know what I'm going to do? What? Declare her loyalty to Israel. <laughs> and then if she doesn't, we'll know. I'm just kidding. Obviously. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll, we'll, we'll hold out some kind of uh, reward that she that will be unattainable unless she swears, swears loyalty. Yeah. To your favorite country, Israel. Yeah. Actually, so. you know what? She's going to have to declare her loyalty to uh, Palestine. Palestine, yeah, I yeah. think that'll that'll be less difficult for her. <laughs> so, okay, well, we should uh, in that case just get straight into yeah. the news of the week. So, it's uh, Democrats suck, Republicans suck. Isn't that weird? Isn't that terrible? For uh, Democrats suck this week, there were a lot of options. Actually, that's kind of a theme of this show. Like, I, I think when we started this feature, we didn't actually mean for it to turn out this way. Like, I think we I think we were expecting to have a lot of fun, like as much fun with the Republican portion of this as the Democrat portion. Right. But it's turned out we frequently have a surfeit of material on the Democratic side. And sometimes we're searching for something on the Republican side. I don't know. Is, is, am I wrong I mean, about that? I think that what happens is that we as people who are. I mean, I, I would say that I'm very much to the left of of Democrats. I think you're mostly like you're a little bit less ideologically bound than I am. 
Mm. But both of us are obvious. Well, obviously, he's the left of Republicans. But I think that what happens is that there's so much oxygen spent on the Republicans. Right. And it's like it's more disappointing. And it's also, you know, I think part of it is that the media has was so adversarial towards Trump that that's true after a while it's so like oh much, did yeah. you hear what trump said about yeah. this like, right. like jesus of, yes of course i heard i heard it fifty thousand right, times right. And then, you know are we, are we gonna yeah. say it again right uh, which isn't to dismiss all the terrible stuff he did but a few right. things one is that the focus of uh, of it was often mis like on the less terrible things that he did in fact sometimes it was just the opposite you know advocating for the opposite of what he did no matter what like you know syria afghanistan and the other thing is that if we care about those issues, right, if we care about like standing with immigrants, then we need to be focusing on that when the Democrat is in power, too. Let's uh, yeah. if we could look at this this New York Times article, which to, to me symbolize. <laughs> this is so funny. So it's a New York Times headline. Democrats once outraged take a quieter approach to migrant children. This yeah. is great. So. So the, the subhead is House Democrats led angry efforts to denounce the Trump administration's treatment of migrant children. With the issue bedeviling President Biden, they are voicing worries privately. <laughs> so, I mean, basically what they're saying is actually we're going to start being kind of dicks on the on the immigration thing. Right. Less I, I, they're I, like halves, a halvesy, a semi. Yeah, well, half counts, right? Uh, yeah. Said, oh, that's. That's no, right. that's the that, audience doesn't but, know. That, yeah, no. Doesn't. Well, yeah, which is why make sure you join our paywalled Substack because mm. we have a great uh, we have a great synopsis of a great episode of Kerber Enthusiasm involving right. an incest survivor group where that joke is explained. But the the, yeah. the thing that's hilarious, I mean, what they're basically saying is uh, in this article and it's it's a classic sort of trial balloon article where you have a bunch of officials who are whispering to a reporter that they trust that, yeah, actually, yes, we said a whole bunch of stuff during the Trump years, but it turns out like the immigration thing's kind of kind of a problem. And we're going to have to be we're going to have to be pretty hardcore about, about it occasionally. So our language is going to change. And so just sort of brace yourself. right? So they put that out there so that, you know, a month and a half from now, when they when the next headline is, I don't know. Democrats putting people in in little cages again or something like that. It just it just softens the blow a little bit, right? And then you get you get a few you get a few uh, indications back about words maybe you shouldn't use or things didn't go right. over so well, blah blah blah, right? But right. It, it, that that headline to me just is that uh, Glenn tweeted about this too. It's like this is that's the modern Democratic Party in a nutshell, right there. That they are outraged, and then once they actually get the chance to to do something about it they're marginally slightly better than the republicans are apparently well they're better language wise right they're better i mean this is exactly the issue right that we were just talking about i hadn't seen this article by the way but yeah the discourse and the rhetoric is much better and then there's slight policy difference right well with with the trump thing the thing the thing that made the the trump policy bad was that they were intentionally doing it to try to create separations right so that children would end up apart from their parents that had that did already happen anyway as part of kind of the normal process of processing people who were caught up in the uh, immigration like if you if you had any right. parents who had any kind of criminal justice issue they had to be separated from their kids at some point in the process the Trump policy was to do that on purpose as right. a deterrent, a deterrent right. which is like it's like a cut an order of magnitude more fucked than, than, right. than the, exactly. the previous thing. But what they're basically saying is we're going to basically have some the same policies that, you know, would have been unpopular if Trump had done them. But deal with it because it's us now. And also, we should give a shout out to Bill Clinton for his own, uh, you know, deterrence policy that basically made crossing the border much more deadly. How did he do that? In 1994, President Bill Clinton established a prevention through deterrence border strategy for the Border Patrol that concentrated enforcement resources on major entry corridors. This made it difficult for migrants to make illegal entries at those locations. Consequently, many of them went around those areas to make their entries at remote locations that were not patrolled so heavily, such as the Arizona desert. This resulted in a humanitarian crisis. According to the U.S. Border Patrol data, 7,216 people died while illegally crossing the southwest border at remote locations.
populations in the 20 year period from 1998 to 2017, most of them perished in the desert from dehydration, hypothermia, or heat stroke. And the actual number of deaths is actually much higher. It is, a, it's basically the, a, the same principle of making life either literally impossible or miserable to act as a deterrent, but that doesn't work. Oh, I forgot to mention that Biden, Biden blew off the, the student debt. Oh yeah. Thing. Let's, can you but explain we, that? We don't need, we don't need to get into it, but it's no, just funny there's... because we talked about it a lot. And now he, they did, they decided not to do it at all. So there's that. So, right. Anyway. So he's not even doing the like watered down student right. debt thing he promised. Right. Let alone something actually substantive that, you know, for instance, Bernie Sanders wanted to do. Right. Yeah. Uh, all right. So what do we have for Republican suck? Okay, so for Republicans suck, I have a kind of substantive thing. Florida is the latest Republican state to cut off pandemic unemployment benefits. So just reading at the Hill, Florida cuts off 300 weekly, $300 weekly pandemic unemployment benefits. This is a good infographic since what theme of the show is good infographics for bad things. Florida, federal pandemic unemployment compensation payments will expire on June 26, 2021. Additional federal benefit programs will continue through September 6, 2021. But it's funny because for people only listening, it it says Florida in big in big text, and then it says federal pandemic unemployment compensation in big test text. And then under it in smaller text, payments will expire on June 26, 2021. Hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, it's kind of like those t-shirts that are like, I went to blah, 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 and all I got was this t-shirt. Right, yeah. I went to Florida and all I got was $300 a week, which I'm not getting anymore. Right. It's going to be interesting to see what happens on the federal side with all this stuff, because remember, the justification for calling all of this transformational was the idea that this was a lot of this stuff is going to be permanent. If it ends up not being that, it's going to be interesting. But of course, the the southern states are, are going to yank the benefits first. They are the trailblazers in that. But again, the, the theme of this episode and every show, scratch a Democrat, scratch the the rhetoric and they're almost as bad it's fun again I, I don't mean to harp on this but like during the bush years the the republicans like i they just felt legitimately way more villainous to me for yeah. some reason i can't i can't figure out exactly why that is because the ones we have now aren't any less ridiculous but yeah they were they were, they were very like darth vader like during during the dick cheney years yeah and to be fair i mean dick cheney himself is pretty like dark like dark vader maybe it's just the, the post trend i just it's hard for me to take the republicans seriously after trump i, I guess but d- did anything else happen yeah um, i mean end? maggie i thought we could just show obviously marjorie uh taylor, taylor green. green uh i don't know if you guys saw this she made an interesting comparison i did not see this oh yeah if we could just play the jake tapper tweet this woman is mentally ill. You know, we can look back in a time She's in history about Pelosi. where people were told to wear a gold star and they were definitely treated like second class citizens, so much so that they were put in trains and taken to gas chambers in Nazi Germany. And this is exactly the type of abuse that Nancy Pelosi is talking about. She says Speaker Pelosi wanting members of Congress to get vaccinated and not wear masks is exactly the type of abuse as murdering Jews. I mean, it's it's amazing because I, I, I like the idea that uh, that putting people on trains and gassing them to death makes is that's what that's what that's what it means citizen? to be a, be a second class citizen. Yeah, I know. It's like the biggest. <laughs> what honestly, does traveling it's, third class look like. <laughs> I, yeah, it's like that's I know that is the fun that that stuck out to me. Also, it's like, you know, Hitler, the problem with Nazis is that they treated Jews like Second class citizens, the biggest understatement. <laughs> if only they treated Jews like, like second, class second class citizens. citizens. That's, you know, it's the extermination part that is probably more significant. Um, <laughs> ironically, what she did do there, totally unwittingly, is given that Palestinians are literally second class citizens, she basically condemned the treatment of Palestinians totally unwittingly mm. by decrying treating people as second class citizens. And she doubled. I mean, that is like I've seen that before. The the logo marking people with. Oh, the whole a vaccine passport yeah, thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which you can have criticisms of. And let me tell you something. Definitely still not comparable to the Nazi Holocaust. No. The no. gold star thing is a bit more well, life limiting. 
Yeah, I mean, like you, I've seen this in the protests about the new normal. I mean, across Europe, they have people who are marching and they, they're wearing little yellow stars. It's infuriating because in some cases, I'm actually kind of sympathetic with some of the things they're saying. Like the vaccine passport thing is legitimately concerning on a couple of levels. There are applications there that are potentially a problem, right? Because it's it it does resemble the sort of social credit score concept of you will be denied services unless if you don't have x y and z and so we're going to create levels of citizenship for people who in other words like if you don't have a vaccine you you can't go into the store you can't you can't use this right. service you can't use that service and then you, you could theoretically use that same logic for all sorts of things right so if you're if you're in debt if you're uh, if you haven't paid your child support if you haven't done whatever right there are some theoological concerns there that are legitimate and but yet you, only weakened by the yeah you know, it to putting, Nazi putting, Germany. putting it on a Putting it, comparing it to you know putting put on trains and taking to Auschwitz is um kind of kind of hurts the argument yeah. a little bit maybe doesn't quite do justice to what you're trying to say well then she doubled down on it and this is actually you she's know a this bright is, one though she is you a bright see. shining star and <laughs> in their eyes it just it, she just radiates that kind of that 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 that, that uh, rapier like wit remember in Dumb and Dumber he goes tell her I have a rapist wit um. <laughs> This is so bad that Kevin McCarthy condemned it, which takes a lot. Uh, Green's comments have been met with harsh criticism. Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney calling them evil lunacy. And Democratic Congressman Jim McGovern says Green should resign. But last night, when Green was asked about the comments, she doubled down. So I stand by all of my statements. I said nothing wrong. And I think any, any rational Jewish person didn't like what happened in, in Nazi Germany and any rational Jewish person doesn't like what's happening with overbearing mass mandates and overbearing vaccine policies. Do you understand though why some would be upset and offended by the comment? Well, do you understand how people feel about being forced to wear masks or being forced to have to take a vaccine or even have to say that whether they've taken it or not? Okay, so as a as someone who I would consider myself rational, a, a space rational Jewish person, and I got to say, not as upset by the mask mandates. It's close. But after it's reflecting close. a yeah, lot up, up, upon upon reflection, upon further reflection, I realized the 6 million Jews killed isn't the best parallel. Yeah. For mask mandates. But <laughs> I love also her reasoning is Jews don't like the Holocaust. Right. They, as if that's the, you know, that's the first part of the reasoning, as right. if like that's part of why she's rational right. Jews wouldn't like the Holocaust. Right. Yes. She's, so as she's opposed almost to all the irrational Jews who like it, love it, who go crazy yeah. for it. <laughs> but uh, and again, the second class citizens, it's just great. You know, the Nazi, of course, the, the Warsaw Ghetto uprising was over voting rights. The right. The chant of, of the partisans was one to man, never one get vote. a good seat in a restaurant. Yeah, it always terrible. put you in the back. Yeah, yeah. she she's just, it's really funny because the reporter she's trying to help her out. Right. You know, she's yeah. she's, she's right. saying, OK, I, I, I get that that you're just you're, du you're doubling down on that. But let's let's play a little game where we just sort of try to understand each other a little bit. And do, right. you, do you see where maybe all these other people are coming from? Right. Where they, where they say it's like not the same thing when people are mass murdered right. and, and asked to wear a mask and and she she said it like the most gentle way possible you know it, it, she was extending the sort of journalistic olive branch there green just couldn't she just couldn't see it she just has she's like a one note human being you know yeah i mean what she was basically giving her a chance to do was say of course it's not as bad i'm just right. saying yeah, exactly. that there's um, something yeah but i mean how dumb do you have to be does she have a Jew? I'll be your Jewish advisor, Matt Marge. You need Jewish Jewish advisor. You'd be well served in that role. You'd probably yeah. have a lot of work. I'd have a lot of work. I definitely yeah. go into. I mean, she wouldn't be comfortable with my <laughs> pro Palestine um, probably uh, not. suggestions. But she's so dumb, she probably would be would say them without knowing I, it. I went through your prepared remarks for this morning. I have a few notes. <laughs> <You know>. uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like pure nothing red. major just a few yeah. notes yeah it's good but could be even better but yeah she gave her the chance to do kind of the equivalent i'm sorry if you're offended by what i said right yeah 
Yeah. And I'm sorry, you're right. It was hyperbole. But at the end of the day, there's still something. Yeah. I mean, it's she could make her she you know what there you could make you just got to sell it better. There yeah. is, you know, nothing wrong with comparing gas chambers to right. mask she, mandates, but you just got to be just to do a better job of it. She, 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 she was basically saying, OK, I, I hear that, but people are going to think you're a, a fucking idiot. Right. So, like, can you can you just say I'm not an idiot? But yeah, I'm playing the hot know, cost. Yeah, but she's not to, gonna, she can't lie, Matt. I, I know. She's but an honest her, her, resp- her response was, I, no, I can't say, I can't right. say that. I, you know, it was, I love the way bad. we're expecting like reflection and reasonable thought from someone who just like compares the no, Holocaust to. I, no, 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 I know. But, but it is true that most people will walk things back a little bit, especially on this issue. Like Mark Ruffalo, who walked back describing what Israel was doing as genocide, very disappointing. Marjorie Taylor Greene is just like. Mark Ruffalo. They're the same person, actually. The she, same was, person. she was she was she was great in whatever that movie was about uh the Hulk. Yeah. Oh yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah Dirty yeah, Waters. Just, yeah. 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 I, I feel guilty about making fun of Marjorie Taylor Greene because it's it, it's such a cliche of kind of blue state such journalism. Low, like right, I've done such... it. Like I, I did a massive feature on Michelle Bachman once, which was just like, look at this idiot. You feel yeah, guilty the, that you contributed to uh it's not the it's not the same thing as like having to dig and understand a subject, you know. All you're yeah. really doing is like, well, here's a here's a really dumb person who got right. elected, and 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 here's here's how bad it is. Right. Um. People people do enjoy reading that stuff. But. Yeah. You remember when she said that a woman? She was like, she was really mad at Rick Perry because Rick Perry like signed off on the HPV vaccine mm-hmm. for the wrong reasons because I think he owned stocks in it or something. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And she obviously really opposed it and was, even though, by the way, it saves women's lives from cervical cancer, but that's neither here nor there, but she really opposed it and was told an anecdote about a woman who took her daughter to get a vaccine, the vaccine, and became retarded thereafter. <laughs> Rapid onset retardation. <laughs> retarded thereafter yeah that has to go on the list of uh t- t-shirt ideas do, do you feel he placed the health and safety of young girls in the state of texas behind or below the the need for campaign funds well i will tell you that i had a mother last night come up to me here in tampa florida after the debate she told me that her little daughter took that uh took that vaccine that injection and she suffered from mental retardation thereafter. <laughs> the T-shirt, it's mental retardation it. thereafter. Thereafter, yeah. Mental and, retardation thereafter. Yeah, to be fair, I oversold it. I got to keep it real. I didn't, not intentionally, but it, it it's more nuanced than what I said. It's not that she became mentally retarded thereafter. It's that she suffered mental retardation thereafter. Right, right. So it could have been a couple of days. It could have been a year-long process of becoming retarded because of the vaccine. <laughs> it could well, have been um, intermittent. Yeah, it could have been intermittent. Idiopathic retardation. I- idiopathic, uh, sudden onset, rapid onset, idiopathic. I mean, I feel bad. I should be more, tra- we should give her, we should be fairer and say it may not be sudden. Again, it could have taken years for the retardation to catch up for the catch for the up. onset of uh, retardation. But yeah, I mean, it's uh, we're just we're 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 basically doing for back backmen what we did for Marjorie Taylor Greene, telling them how to sell their right like, sociopathic or or Mental uh, retardation thereafter. Yeah, it's less, less of a T-shirt than a band name. Yeah, like, exactly. Like a classic yeah. rock band like yeah. Bachman Tur- Turner Overdrive, you yeah. know, like mental retardation thereafter. Yeah, we should make that. That'll be people will love that. What would their f- hit song be? We'll have to figure that out. Yeah. All right. Uh, OK, HPV, so for HPV, HPV vaccine. What would it be? Death retardation by HPV. Is that that's not really a song? No, that's not a song. You would, you would have to it would have to be something kind of the HPV blues yeah oh no it's the vaccine that's bad yeah needles and pins uh, yeah the... <laughs> of death <laughs> right needles and pins of death and and retardation yeah let's let's go to uh isn't, isn't that, that weird, weird? Yeah. isn't that weird that's me right yeah
this this is pretty good this is this is uh it's Whoa. it's well it's sad is what it is yeah this is, uh, a, this is like a genre of of terrible and uh mixed genre yeah yeah so i'm just gonna read from this uh story i found it in newsweek but uh there's actually video too that was on the web uh missing man found dead inside dinosaur statue uh, so at first, it, it feels like the plot of one of those sort of forensic pathology mystery uh, shows like Silent Witness or something like that. Uh, so here's the lead. A 40-year-old man was found dead inside the leg of a decorative paper mache dinosaur statue in Spain after being reported missing by his family just a few hours earlier. The man who has not yet been named was found dead by a father and son in Santa Coloma, De, Grama, uh, de Gramene, a Barcelona suburb, at around 12 p.m. local time on Saturday, uh, according to local news site El Mural. After being informed by the father that a man appeared to be dead inside the dinosaur statue, three units of the uh, Generalitat, several members of the firefighters' special rescue team were also deployed as they had to saw off multiple parts of the dinosaur in order to extract the body from the decorative statue. Footage uh, posted to Twitter by El Miral showed the extent of the extraction process as the sound of the saw can be heard while firefighters and ambulance are present and an ambulance are present at the scene. I mean, it, it doesn't really show you much except that they're they're, they're kind of hovering over this dinosaur trying to find ways to get into into it uh the local police department uh, are currently investigating the incident but told uh la vanguardia that there were quote no indications of criminality in relation to his death and here's the plot twist because you figure dead oh, man dead man so found sad. inside a dinosaur it's got to be a murder right Depart the department told ARA that it was believed that a man the man crawled inside the dinosaur statue after he dropped his phone into it before getting stuck when he fell upside down. Poli police are awaiting the re results of the autopsy to, to determine the cause of death and to work out how he was able to enter the decorative statue. The dinosaur was the last remaining advertising figure in the area, which was created al alongside several other decorative figures to promote a now closed movie theater so a little bit of a plot twist there like yeah and I, I i was almost positive this was going to turn out to be some diabolical murder right. where you, usually you find a body in i don't know a dumpster uh, a, yeah a dumpster or maybe sometimes they'll put it into like when they're laying cement for right a, a beam of a building that's or like a mafioso like that. move right yeah exactly right so they you know somebody they're, they're demolishing a building and they find a body in there right. oh my god who, right. how long has this person been in there in this case this guy like lost his phone in a, in a stegosaurus and tried to get get out and got stuck that's really awful that's I a mean, hor horrible horrible story, star story yeah, which yeah. I, I think that should be this week's terrible my yeah be weird, i guess i'm we'll sorry be, it's fine I mean, no I... it's it, we're just emphasizing the fine line between both of those i mean i mean the, the, the dinosaur part makes it weird makes it weird also i feel like this is a mystery where we're going to find out it actually was a murder mm. like maybe the cops the cop saying it was an accident was the murderer. They put a phone in there yes, and stuffed the guy upside the down, yeah. right? Yeah. To, uh, to make it look like he fell in there by accident, because that's naturally right. what you would think. I know, right? easy, you know, right. No one would look into it. Right? It just looks like a natural death by, by natural death by, not natural death, but uh, unintentional death by cell phone retrieval attempt in dinosaur leg. Right, they'll, they'll overlook the three bullets in the head or right. whatever it is, you know, or right. the, or the weird, like ritual clear, like the marking of the body with right. six, six uh, missing six. liver. Yeah, exactly. Right, yeah. Yeah. You know, what really makes the story terrible, even more what? terrible that nobody had sex with the body. Well, obviously, I mean, <laughs> but really what this makes it terrible is that it was at the dinosaur was an advertisement for a movie theater. That's not even open. Right. Cause that's sign of the times, right? It's now closed. Like he didn't even die in the name of this of movie advertising theater. this movie theater. Yeah, if he had, they could have named the movie theater after him. Right. The the Juan <laughs> Do. Yeah. Juan Do. Yeah. Juan, Juan Do Memorial. Don't Juan drop your cell phone in a Stegosaurus movie theater. Yeah. Yeah. Now you know what that is. That's a living monument and advertisement to not. Right. I mean, people do that. They jump into the train tracks to get their phones. There's probably a long list of really stupid ways that people have died 
chasing their phones that don't involve just driving off the road or into somebody, right? Anyway, weird story. Okay, well, what do we have for... Um, isn't, isn't that, that terrible? terrible? One, isn't that terrible is that there was a hornet or a wasp in my room and I tried to get it out of the door by opening it and it refused to go and I had to spray it and I don't okay. like killing animals. And then I had to crunch it under my foot, not my bare foot. So anyway, that's a personal, isn't that terrible? <laughs> this is this is promising already. Yeah. Okay. So I love the British. I know this, of course, is from guess where it's from the mirror, the mirror. Yeah. So what we have is, you know, it's look, we've all been through this. It's happened to all of us before. Who among us has this not happened to? Uh, but new husband forced to apologize <laughs> to wife after offensive birthday card mix up. Greg Morgan ordered a personalized birthday card for his wife, but the wrong one was delivered. And he quickly clarified that at no point did I want to call my wife M asterisk NGE face. And we now know that that word is minge. Now, you may, not want, to, you may want to know, you may ask yourself, what is minge? And I'll tell you what it is. It's, it's a vulgar term. For... It's a vulgar term for the hair surrounding the, uh, I'm just reading, no, I don't want to read the ugh, the one, the Urban Dictionary one is just too gross. So it's... I'll just read, you know what? I'll read the, the Cambridge uh, definition. Ready for it? Offensive for a woman's genitals or vagina. Minge. <laughs> Did you hear my playing it? No. You... Minge. <laughs> Wait, 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 wait. Again, please. Minge. <laughs> Minge. Now you can, Minge. What you can, what you can do is you can play it. I think that's the American pronunciation, right? I think there's an wait, option. Wait, but, but let's hear the British version. Yeah, exactly. Minge. You hear that difference? Not really. Minge. <laughs> Minge. Minge. I hear the difference. Minge versus right. Minge. We have to hear how this word would be used in context. As it happens, there was a South Park episode. Oh, okay, let's do it. Looks like your time is up, Tally. I've led my adoring fans right to you. All right, Oprah. I've shown my fans that, uh, ow, what? All right, everyone back. Get back, I said. <laughs> what the hell is this? Nobody moves, nobody gets hurt. Minji, what are you doing? Getting out of here, Gary. One way or another. What is going on? Shut up. Shut up, you miserable old cow. So help me, I'll blow your brains out. I want a chopper. You got that? And a jet waiting at the airport. Minji. Have you lost your mind? Come on, Gary. You said you always wanted to see Paris. Not like this, Minji. Not like this. All right, all right, we all get right, it. Gig yeah. is up. That's really funny. I did not yeah. know that. Um. All right. So okay, so, so, got, so man says. Yeah. What, happen so, what happens? So just so the guy has to clarify. Of course, a husband was left red faced after a birthday card mix up saw him accidentally call his wife a minge face. Uh, Greg Morgan, forty four, admits that he often leaves things to the last minute, and he had to turn to brain box candy to ensure Angela, also 44, had a card to open on her birthday. He picked the perfect card and added a personalized message. But when it arrived, the post said, it arrived in the post, he was shocked when he saw the card read, happy birthday, minge face. I don't know why he opened it. Brain box candy has, have since apologized for the mix up and admitted the order must have slipped through the net. But thankfully, Angela from Carefully Wales was able to see the funny side. Greg said, I tend to leave things very much the last minute. And rather than a run the mill card, I thought I'd treat her and get a bit of a bespoke one, design one. When it came and I opened it, I just looked at it and thought, oh my God, I know I like to send funny cards, but I can't send that one to her. I get a massive slap. And no point did I want to call my wife minge face. It is not a word I particularly would ever use if I'm honest, especially around her. And then they have a corny card that he actually meant to send her. Happy birthday to the wife I want to annoy for the rest of my days. I mean, one could say maybe by sending He's cards right and saying there. minge face. She puts her card up on display. Oh my God, can you imagine her parents who are in their 70s coming around and seeing that? No. Uh, Greg contacted Brainbox, who apologized and sent out the correct card, but unfortunately missed Angela's birthday. 
Council worker Angela Morgan, who is mum to seven-year-old Delcy Morgan, said she found the situation hilarious and she knows the mix-up wasn't his fault. I got a happy birthday card, not just not the one I was supposed to. He does call me a few things, but he doesn't call me that. When I saw that word on the card, I just burst out laughing because I wasn't expecting to see it. When Greg said, this is what turned up, and he was quite serious, I just thought it was so funny and burst out laughing. It was a spectacular mix-up. I know a lot of people have ordered cards, and they've come with the wrong name and things like that, but this was just really funny. I did think, does anybody really order that card? I guess so. I mean, you know who they should I'm be apologizing skeptical. I, to. I think the guy actually ordered that Well, card. if he didn't order it, you know who they have to be apologized thing to? Who? The person who probably was very disappointed to not get it to get to to have the oh, person you sent yeah, that to the, the, get this corny generic yeah to the wife i want to annoy for the rest of my days yeah right so we have to find out who the person was who sent that the minge face card yeah and we have to and i hope Brainbox apologizes to them and, and sends them a yearly card that says that so they can send it to other people you would think like a minge face card is something that would have to go up to corporate. Like they'd have to sign off on that. Don't you think? I mean, if they did, that would be terrible. Uh, control, you know, stifling of free speech. I don't know. I'm the, the, the guy, the look at that guy's face. Looks, he, he, it looks like he's not being honest with us. I know. It reminds me again of that house episode that I often, you know, for whatever reason, often comes to mind. Uh, Which one? Where the couple has an STI. And he tells him and that it's he, a toilet seat thing. Yes. And, and yes. then the husband's like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And then he's like, OK, your husband cheated on you because that's not possible. And he jumped on that explanation. So why did I bring that up? There's something like that guy that he he, he protesteth too much, I think, like that. that whole... Yeah, he does. You know why? Because he said, for instance, he kept saying, oh, I like to do things last minute, but not that last minute. And I actually thought I was like, what's wrong? With is he is he super Catholic? Like, why is he so guilty about this? Right, and, yeah. you know, and now I know why, because he did send the minge face card. Right. That sounds like an Agatha Christie book, the I minge think, face I, card. Yeah, he he this is like a thing he planned with his buddies. Mm -hmm. I'm going to send a pretend it's an accident, get in the news. Right. And have my wife holding up a card that says minge face. Yeah, right. Um, like internationally. Right. Also, yeah, I mean, I don't know if the mirror had to, luckily we needed it. Isn't that terrible? But I don't know if the mirror had to do this story. They didn't they, have to. They do took the, story. the bait. They took so the did bait. we. The yeah, minge so, bait. Yeah. Look, I learned something new today because I did not know about that word. And what people don't know, and they'll find out in this paywall section, is I thought there's another word. And you should make sure you watch that. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That. That was even funnier, although I fell for it too. So, you know, it's all it's all good. Yeah. It's all it good, turned, man. It's all good, man. So, OK, all those things were terrible, weird and sucking. So, guys, we have an amazing guest for today. OK, and here's something funny. During this taping, I get a text from our guest. OK, as people may not know or people may know, we uh, tape this over Zoom. Thank you, Zoom. You can uh, sponsor us now. Aaron writes to me. Zoom is blocked in Syria because of the sanctions because of the blue Zoom is blocked in Syria because of the US sanctions. So we got to do another platform. So we will. And uh, welcoming back to the show, the man who people think got us canceled, uh, although he didn't, though we did play play that up as the reason now people know because we did come clean. It was all because we wanted Bashar al-Assad to be our third host. And in fact, Aaron is in Syria trying to tie up loose ends, red tape, there's a bunch of red tape, but we think he's going to come back with uh, with Assad's Han John Hancock, another great band name, Assad's, Assad's John, John Hancock. Hancock. That's, yeah. We'll that so down. yeah, but 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 Aaron is the Aaron is a journalist whose work uh, appears in places like The Nation, and he is the host of The Pushback, which is a great show great youtube show on uh at the which is part of the gray zone and he's the one of the reasons why we wanted to have him on this week is because he did something that was really <laughs> was really funny and interesting for those uh who've been following the russia gate story obviously we we talk about it all the time a quote unquote major development in the story was that first that a senate committee concluded that collusion happened because Constantine Kal the Kalimnik, who was this character we're going to hear about a little bit, um, received polling data from 
Paul Manafort. And so this was turned into this story that uh, essentially the Russians were trying to get secret inside info from the Trump campaign about the state of the election so that they could know whom to send extremely effective Facebook memes to help swing the election for Donald Trump. So the, the whole case for collusion, which, which was later ratified by the Biden administration, I, I guess it was about a month ago, the, the Treasury Department, hangs on this idea that this character, Konstantin Kalimnik, ha, was either a Russian agent or had connections to uh, the Russian secret services. And in so receiving polling data from the Trump campaign, that constituted the collusion between the two sides. So this character, Konstantin Kalimnik, is central to the entire thing. This entire five-year saga all comes down to this guy. And nobody tried to interview the guy. Throughout this entire time, nobody tried to interview him. Not, and, and, and They were being polite. They didn't want to bother him. They didn't want to bother him. So Aaron just Aaron called him up and, and did an interview with him and found out a bunch of stuff. And of course, all these people who have been trumpeting the importance of this person as, you know, like literally the the most crucial character in the most important story of the last five years, uh, nobody picked the story up. Nobody, nobody mentioned the interview. Nobody followed it up. Nobody themselves tried to reach out to him. So we wanted to talk to Aaron about what he found out and what he thinks the significance of that is. So we're looking forward to this interview. Yeah, he called up and we're calling out. That's right. So let's let's talk to our uh, our Assadist brother in arms, <laughs> uh, Aaron Mate. And by the way, make sure you check out our last week's Substack or yeah, our Substack, our most recent Substack only because it uh, is with Rania Kalik. And since we're going to get canceled for this, we might as well advertise that also because, um, mm. you know, two Assadists in one week. Well, four, because obviously you and I are that, yeah. Right. Welcome, Aaron Mate, back to the show. The man who, according to mythology, got us. According to unconfirmed reports. Unconfirmed reports. But people familiar with the matter. Yes. uh, Got us canceled by Rolling Stone. But for real, that's not true. Um, (laughs) And you are joined. But, I mean, we're really making it hard to prove this because you're literally joining us from. Where are you? Katie. I thought you guys weren't supposed to talk about my real mission here, which is right. to negotiate a co-host position for Bashar al-Assad in right. Damascus, where I am right now. I, yeah. But I literally am. That's why I, know. I am in Damascus. Yeah. It's, fun. yeah. it's really funny because our last uh, Substack only paid section was with Rania Kalik, who literally, as we were recording like a, a month ago, I joking, I said to Matt, guess who's coming into our show? You know, it was like while we were denying being Assadists. Guess who's coming? Guess who's coming to my house in five minutes? Ronnie Cal and he and he said Ronnie Callick, and sure enough, this is kind of like this, 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 this is more there. impressive, I would say. Yeah, you're there. You're actually there. Yeah, yeah. He's actually in Syria. Yeah. So, are, are, are you committing mission, war crimes at the at the moment, though? I mean, like like that would that would give us even more cred if you could, you know. Well, according to some people, really useful idiots, the show is a war crime. You know, <laughs> uh, the way some people talk about it sometimes on Twitter. <laughs> when you guys host Max Blumenthal or something, or Rania, <laughs> don't be don't be bashful. Yeah, don't, don't be don't, don't be, be bashful modest. there. Yeah, exactly. you also. Could you talk about your decision to call up Konstantin Kalimnik and how that came about? Yes. Yeah, so, Konstantin Kalimnik has become like the last Russian standing in Russia Gate. Um, all the other conspiracy theories are pretty much dead now. No one really, be- at least no one. Not as many people at least believe in the P-tape. I'm sure there are some diehard Rachel Maddow watchers who still believe in the P-tape. But the P-tape is pretty much off the table now. Most people recognize that Christopher Steele, the Steele dossier, was a joke. Um, and all the other various conspiracy theories we heard. But Konstantin Kalimnik is still in the game. They are still trying to keep him alive. And who he is is he's a longtime business, business associate of Paul Manafort, worked with him in Ukraine. When um, Manafort was indicted by the Mueller team, He wasn't indicted for anything to do with Russia or collusion or even the 2016 election. But the Mueller team indicted him for like in this like esoteric tax and lobbying case under 
laws that haven't really been used very much in, in U.S. history. And they wrote these like sweeping long indictments that got you know, and and sentence and and memos and court filings that like suggested kind of there was something there to collusion. But ultimately, both judges in his case stated the obvious that his case has nothing to do with Russia or collusion. It was about his lobbying work and consulting work in Ukraine and hiding his ta- his income from that on his tax form. But because Russia it was such a big thing, the media kind of overlooked the like missing Russia and. And just like there was constant coverage of Manafort, and it was made to be this big thing. And there's speculation he's going to flip on Trump. That was the smoking. That was going to deliver the smoking collusion. I mean, this all actually happened. It's hard to remember now, but this was like every development like this was like would like dominate the news cycle for a day or two. So Konstantin Kalimnik comes in. He is one of the few people in the Trump orbit who actually has a Russian passport. And so I think that's why he's now still being targeted. And he came in when uh, in 2018, all of a sudden he was indicted by Mueller in a witness tampering case that had to do with Manafort's lobbying and tax case. And basically Kalimnik sent some text messages to some people being like, hey, uh, Paul wants to talk to you and stuff like that. There's like 13 messages that Mueller has produced. They're really, I mean, as I read them, you can read them for yourself. They're, I don't think they're a very big deal. But, but anyway, Mueller used this to indict Kalimnik for witness tampering. And Mueller also filed court filings that said that Kalimnik is assessed by the FBI to have Russian intelligence ties. And so when he said that, the media went crazy because this was finally some kind of like connection to Russia and collusion. Someone who has ties to Russian intelligence. Now, Mueller never defined what ties means. So does right. ties mean he he talked to someone? Uh, does ties mean he knows someone? Uh, you know, like Katie and I text a lot, so we have ties. So is it possible Kalimnik? I don't know. They are, but like I, I'm not even going to assume that he even texted or communicated with anyone because we have no idea what these ties actually are. Mueller never defined it, and I think he never defined it for a real reason. It's because he has no actual serious ties to Russian intelligence that mean anything substantive. But they needed him to create the impression that they, were, that they were getting close to some kind of Russia, Trump-Russia conspiracy theme. So Klimek's indicted for this. And then, of course, then um, in a court session, the mother team accuses Paul Manafort of lying to them about all these different things, including his contacts with Kalimnik. And and they also, uh, Andrew Weissman, the leading prosecutor, he, he says this kind of ambiguous thing in court that says that Kalimnik's interactions with Manafort go to the heart of what we're investigating. And even though he doesn't specify what he means by that, the media went crazy and said, the heart, wow, this must mean that like, finally there's a collusion thing. And Mark Warner, the Senator from Virginia, a democratic leader on the intelligence committee said, this is the closest thing we've seen to real live actual collusion. And this was in January, 2019. So near the end of the Mueller probe. So this was really exciting. Then the, then the Mueller report comes along and Mueller repeats this thing about ha- Klimnik having Russian intelligence ties, doesn't specify what he means by that, what those ties are. And then he says, we found no evidence that, uh, oh, sorry, and I'm missing a very, very key part. I apologize. Okay. And Weissman also says when he said, when he accuses Manafort of lying about his interactions with Kalimnik, that Manafort gave polling data to Kalimnik and that Manafort lied to the special counsel about that. So when Andrew Weissman talked about the heart of his case, that's what he's saying. I'm sorry I left that part out. It's been a long day. But so basically the the innuendo that this fueled was that Manafort was giving Kalimnik, a guy with Russian intelligence ties, secret Trump polling data. And the even though Weissman never alleged it, the uh, interpretation by the media was that this was being given to Kalimnik to give to Russia so that they could like use this polling data to target their sophisticated Russian interference campaign yeah, that, at vulnerable that, American voters and brainwash them into voting for Trump. That's how Asha Rangappa put it all together, basically. Yeah. She, she, yeah. She, she, the, the former FBI analyst who is now a, a media person. Who, basically, the idea was they need this polling data so that they can more strategically deploy Russian anti-masturbation memes or whatever it was on, on Facebook. Yeah. But anyway, mm-hmm. go ahead, go, go ahead. So we can we'll beat it together. So, so what ends up happening though, is that the, the Senate ends up producing this report that says that Kalimnik is an intelligence agent. And then that becomes the smoking gun of collusion, right? Yes. Yes. So, yes. So, so before that, though, was the Mueller report, which says, actually, we found no evidence 
of any connection between this polling data and Russian interference. So basically they're saying that all the innuendo that we just fueled a couple of months ago with Andrew Weissman's statements in court, yeah, sorry, we find no evidence for that whatsoever. Then Kalimnik kind of goes away, we don't hear anything about it, until August of 2020, when all of a sudden, the Senate Intelligence Committee, headed by Mark Warner, who, by the way, when he made that comment about this is the closest thing we've seen to collusion, he speculated that this polling data was used specifically to convince them not to vote for Hillary Clinton. Which, by the way, if you look at the actual social media ads and how many there were, there were barely any. Most of them were during the primary in 2015, and they weren't even about the election. And whatever they were about, they were dumb juvenile memes. And the idea that they could influence one single person into not voting for Hillary Clinton and Trump is just – it's also, insane. Also, why can't it's the so Russians stupid. just go hire a polling firm themselves and spend yeah. a gazillion dollars? Well, anyway, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the irony. And I, by the way – we. Mueller never showed us the polling data that was sent, even though they have all their emails. They have Manafort's emails. They have Kalimnik's emails. They never show us that. That's because, according to Kalimnik and Rick Gates, you know, Rick Gates was the Mueller team's key witness here, actually, on this. He says that the polling data was basically taken, like, from real clear politics, like Trump 43, Clinton 44. And that's what, that's what it was. But yet the media spin was like, this is secret and you went, this is the secret internal proprietary polling data, details, blah, blah, blah. Sensitive and anyway, polling so, data. Sensitive, that sensitive, was the word. Sensitive polling data, yes, yes, yes. So this, the Mark Warner Senate Intelligence Committee report in August 2020 declares all of a sudden, and this is the kind of only new thing that it, that it has. It declares that even though Robert Mueller, who investigated Kalimnik, had all the powers in the world, far more powers than the Senate Intelligence Committee, as the rep Senate report even acknowledges. The Senate report declares that Kalimnik is a Russian intelligence officer. And yes, everybody took that to be, finally, finally, we have the smoking gun. We've connected Russia to the Trump campaign. Even though the report has no evidence whatsoever beyond what Mueller found, and anything that might be different is completely redacted. So we have no idea to judge it in independently for ourselves. But this was an example of the, like, just complete absence of journalism standards throughout Russia Gate, where a declaration is made that serves this kooky, insane narrative of a conspiracy. But despite the absent evidence and despite the countervailing evidence, including that Kalimnik was actually in deep contact with the State Department, was a, a valuable source okay, for it's... the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine. Despite all this, everyone just says, oh, my God, he's a Russian spy collusion. Boom. So, so I want to get into that part of it because that part of it I, I found fascinating. Because if you remember, so John Solomon made a big deal about that, right? Remember the infamous yeah. John Solomon uh, who who wrote for the, I guess, the Hill, and he did yeah. a, an expose saying basically that that Konstantin Kalimnik was a State Department source, yeah. and, and and everybody went crazy talking about how John Solomon is the most irresponsible reporter in the history of reporters. We can't trust this. But the funny thing is, if you actually go back and look, preceding the uh, the John Solomon report is an almost identical story in the New York Times by Ken Vogel yep. and Andrew Kramer saying Russian spy or hustling political operative, the enigmatic figure at the heart of Mueller's inquiry. And it says ex exactly the same thing, basically, that he was a regular visitor to um, to the, the embassy, that he was a source. For the State Department, it, it was just such a strange thing because they they suddenly had to reverse course and present this guy as a Russian intelligence figure, even though there was abundant evidence that he was more of a source to us. He, he worked for the International Republican Institute. He was known to all the expats in Moscow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No, the, but the, it's really it's really important what you're saying because he worked for all this spe speculation. He worked for the Russian government. He spent ten years working for the IRI. Right. The International Re Republican Institute, which is funded by the U.S. government. So the only documented government ties that he has actually are to the U.S. government, where he worked for 10 years for this organization, where he was very trusted and very loved, apparently. He was promoted to a, to a senior position uh, for a, you know, like a, a co congressionally funded organization. And then working for Manafort, yeah, the Senate Intelligence Report acknowledges that he was a valuable resource for the U.S. Embassy in Kiev and had multiple meetings. He even translated during meetings with Victoria Nuland, who was basically leading the U.S. policy in Ukraine, trying to overthrow its government. And there's even a great uh, hacked phone call of her where she's picking the next president. Of she, this is the one where she was saying we can't have uh, or Yats is our guy for for yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, to, yeah, to be the, the guy. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's interesting about that? About the EU. Right. Yeah. Is that. 
let's even let's even assume just for the sake of argument that Kalimnik is is FSB or GRU, then that would raise a host of questions for the IRI, the State Department, Victoria yes. Newland, you know, all these other people who've been letting this guy walk in and out of their their offices for 10 years. But all of that has been smoothed over, right, throughout all of this. Uh, anyway, sorry, go go ahead with your but story. That's, but that's what, that's one of the funniest parts of the Senate Intelligence Report. When they talk about Kalimnik's proximity to the Trump campaign, where really he wasn't involved in the campaign at all. He worked for Manafort, and Manafort was giving him polling data because he wanted to uh, show to people in Ukraine that he was valuable, and he was hoping to get money paid back to him, something that Mueller totally downplayed. But they talk about Kalimnik's proximity to the Trump campaign. They call it a grave counterintelligence threat to the United States. That's a direct quote. When they talk about his proximity to the U.S. embassy in Ukraine, which is far more extensive than his proximity to the Trump campaign, they don't make anything about it. They don't call it a grave counterintelligence threat. And they say that, you know, they don't say anything about it. It's completely inconsistent. But that's because the whole thing doesn't make sense. They have no actual evidence that he is a Russian intelligence officer. They don't show us any. And again, it's just like there's just so many things where this doesn't make sense and where there are holes. So for some reason, the Mueller report, which has all the investigative powers in the world, does not call him a Russian intelligence officer. The farthest they'll go is they'll say that he has Russian intelligence ties, which they don't even define. The Senate, with far less investigative powers, declares him to be a Russian intelligence officer, while also ignoring all this countervailing evidence about his close ties to the U.S. government or downplaying his ties to the U.S. government. And then you look at what Mueller puts forward to try to prove that Kalimnik has Russian intelligence ties. Because Mueller did try to show something. He didn't define what those what ties means. But to justify that vague term, he put forth some evidence. And it's a joke. They say that Kalimnik trained at a Soviet military academy as a linguist where he learned English and Swedish. But, you know, a lot of Russian people went to, you know, you know were in the Soviet army. And in Kalimnik's case, he didn't even serve in the army. He just trained as a linguist. The second piece of evidence that they put forward, and this is something new I have in my story, is they claim that Kalimnik traveled to the U.S. on a Russian diplomatic passport. And they don't spell this out, but the inference there is that he was traveling to the U.S. on a Russian diplomatic passport uh, using that diplomatic passport as cover as an intelligence operative because intelligence operatives often travel to foreign countries under uh, the cover of being a diplomat, right? That's the inference, even though they don't say it. But... I got Kalimnik's actual passport from that period for this story. He gave it to me. Uh, and first of all, it's a red passport. It's not the, issued in the standard uh, green color of a diplomatic passport. And I looked at the exact visa, which Mueller says was issued to uh, under a Russian dipl diplomat designation. That Kalimnik got the visa as a Russian diplomat. But it's a regular visa. It's in the regular category. And there's no mention of, of a diplomat. So... And Mueller cites the exact same date that I have, the visa that I have. And so when I put this to Mueller, I wrote him and I wrote Andrew Weissman, who was the lead prosecutor in the Kalimnik Manafort case. I didn't get a response. The Justice Department, they declined comment. Same with the FBI. Because um, I asked them if they if they have evidence to refute Kalimnik's actual visa, the one he showed me. Because, you know, it's possible he sent me a fake. It looked very real. And I there's video. I, I looked on video of him looking through the passport. And it looks pretty real to me. But um, they, they they declined comment. So you have Kalimnik saying that this claim about him traveling on a Russian diplomatic passport is a complete lie. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the funny part of the story, though, is that it, the, the Senate Intelligence, Intelligence Committee basically names Kalimnik the, the linchpin of the whole thing. Then Biden's administration doubles down about a month ago with the Treasury Department basically saying the same thing, right, that, that Kalimnik – well, the Treasury went even further. So yeah. after all that innuendo about Kalimnik giving polling data to Russia, which, again, the Mueller report explicitly says it has no evidence for, despite the Mueller report saying it has no evidence of, of that, and the Senate report, by the way, saying that too, they also found no evidence that Kalimnik gave polling data to Russia or Russian intelligence. All of a sudden, in April, the Treasury Department puts out a press release where they sanction a bunch of Russians. And one of the people they sanctioned is Kalimnik. And they declare for the first time that a U.S. government body has said so, that Kalimnik gave polling data to Russian intelligence during uh, the 2016 election. And boom, just like when the Senate Intelligence Committee said, finally, now we have our smoking gun. 
even though the Treasury Department put out no evidence for that assertion, just literally like a press release, and this was one sentence of it, and even though when multiple reporters, including myself, asked them what evidence they have to substantiate this, they said no comment. So we have no idea what their evidence is, but we're also supposed to take it on faith, just like every other insane Russiagate claim that has since been debunked. But now we get to the real punchline, which is that throughout this entire time, nobody ever talked to the guy, and you're the first person to call him. Yes. R reporters talked to him. He's given a few interviews before. But he says, according to, according to Kalimnik, he says that no government uh, investigator, intelligence official from the Mueller team with the FBI, uh, from the Treasury Department, no one from the Senate Intelligence Committee, nobody contacted him. Not a single person. Even though he was indicted, uh, even though he's now named as a Russian intelligence officer and is like the linchpin for collusion, no one tried to talk to him. A very similar thing with Julian Assange, another key Russiagate figure. That's what I was going to bring Mueller, up. Why, yeah, is, it, I mean, I, why I, is it that they're not Mueller curious Shuck about interviewing these people? Wouldn't you want to if they are so responsible and criminal? I mean, I I, I found that went out by accident when I was talking to a WikiLeaks person about a totally unrelated thing years ago. I, I guess I, I asked him some question like, well, when when the Mueller people approached you about whatever, you know, what happened? And like, well, they, they never called us. And I, and it, it was just it was amazing to me that that a that that was true and b that that question had never come up in the press before. Apparently, you know, nobody nobody. And this is a this is a similar thing. This guy is supposedly at the center of the biggest news story of the last five years, and yet not a single investigator has tried to interview him. What could possibly yeah. be the reason for that? I I, I I'm I, I'm it's just cause really they, struggling. It's because they're because they're building a narrative. This whole Russiagate thing was about building a narrative, trying to make this whole thing look credible, trying to justify the ridiculous pretext for the Trump-Russia investigation to begin with, which is a suggestion of a suggestion made to George Papadopoulos, a low-level Trump campaign volunteer that's extremely ambiguous as well. And on that basis, they opened up the sweeping investigation into a presidential campaign, which then was shifted into a presidency. And uh, they were doing it for the wrong reasons. You know, the, the intelligence community hated Trump. They hated that he was so such a buffoon. They hated that he was criticizing them. They hated that he was sometimes deviating from their national security state consensus. Well, and it, was, I, it, including including on Syria, by the way. Including uh, on Syria. Definitely yeah. on Syria. And, and, and especially on Russia, on Russia, too, which is very connected to Syria because Russia is heavily involved here. And so they tried to undermine him and they used this investigation to do that. They also used it to sabotage diplomacy with Russia. So everybody inside the Senate, inside the intelligence community who shares, though, that worldview, which certainly all these people do, especially Mark Warner and Adam Schiff, the respective intelligence chiefs for the Senate and House uh, intelligence committees on the Democratic side, they all took part in it and they all did what they could to try to grant it some legitimacy. So that's what I think what the Senate report was. The Senate Intelligence Committee for a long time now has been basically a rubber stamp on the uh, on the CIA and the FBI. They don't really conduct meaningful oversight. Mark Warner, I think, really wanted to make this collusion thing look somewhat credible. I mean, after all, back when the clinic thing first blew up, he was the one who said this is the closest thing to collusion. So I speculate that it was, he was very influential in getting the Senate Intelligence Committee to name Kalimnik a Russian intelligence officer. And then you move forward into the Biden administration. And something else funny happens, not just this Treasury statement. Before that, in February, all of a sudden, so Biden's in office now, and in February, the FBI puts out this alert, a bounty for Konstantin Kalimnik for $250,000. And it's on that 2018 witness tampering case. So a case connected to a larger case that was itself like really esoteric, brought under a very rare foreign lobbying law. Uh, that's already moot because, you know, Trump pardoned Manafort, so Manafort's out of prison now. All of a sudden, the FBI puts out a quarter of a million dollar bounty for witness tampering in that case. And again, if you look at the actual charge sheet, if you go back at what they accuse Klimnik of, it's basically for, for sending 13 text messages to people who Mueller describes as potential witnesses. So they weren't even witnesses yet for Mueller, but, but Mueller calls them potential witnesses in which he thinks that they misrepresented the nature of their lobbying work, that they had said it was also in the U.S. and he was trying to say it was it was just in, in the Ukraine. Whatever. It doesn't matter. The point is you're going to put out – like even if Kalimnik is guilty of that, which I don't think he is, but let's say he is. You're going to put out a quarter of a million dollar uh, bounty for that, which is more than double than most of the people on the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives list, in, list including six – 
alleged murderers uh, and more than double the bounty in this witness tampering case from 2018 than uh, for a- alleged murder. It's really weird. And I think that was political because that was a way of putting out to the public again, Kalinick's name. And it, what's interesting and what actually undermines the Senate is that the FBI in their FBI and their alert for Kalinick in February, when they describe Kalinick, they don't call him a Russian intelligence officer. They revert to Mueller's language, which is that he is assessed to have ties to Russian intelligence. So that that same vague formulation that is not defined and really means nothing, or at least we don't know what it means, because I think they know that they cannot call him a Russian intelligence officer because, especially because this is a uh, court case, they might have to prove that in a court of law and they have no evidence. So this means that to date, no government security or intelligence agency has called Kalimnik a Russian intelligence officer. The Senate Intelligence Committee has and the Treasury Department has. Uh, but the FBI has never called him that. And I think the reason is obvious. That's because they don't have the evidence for it. And this tracks with reporting I did because after the Senate Intelligence Committee report came out and they called him a Russian intelligence officer, I asked the FBI if they agreed with that assessment. And they told me to defer to the Mueller report. Well, the Mueller report does not call him that. So that was, to me, a way of saying that they do not share the Senate Intelligence Committee's assessment. So what does Kalimnik say about all this? About- he thinks it's crazy. He thinks it's absolutely crazy. He made a joke. Uh, th- that's really funny. He said they, they needed a Russian no matter what the size is. And that's a reference to his height. He's because little. He's actually – he's four foot eleven. He's a very, sh- he's a very uh, short person. Uh, and he was joking about that. He's saying that they're trying to turn me into the Russian bad guy because I'm the only Russian the that Russian they have. Russian menace, yeah. yeah. There was so much – for all the talk about Russia Gate and blah, 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 there are very little Russians. You know, there was the Trump Tower they're meeting. They're little. Aaron, like, that's problematic. They're not all little. He happens to be short. They're not all little. Short. Yeah, right. Yeah. Get it? They're very little <laughs> Russians. Uh, sorry, few, few. I'm sorry, Katie. I'm sorry for my uh, – I did not mean to suggest using that kind of language. Uh, very few Russians. Woke button. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so – so that's why he's being targeted. And that's why, look, there's another crazy statement that also came out. And this is, I think, is a part of a coordinated thing by people behind the scenes wanting to put some legitimacy on Russiagate and use Kalinic as their scapegoat. Then the intelligence community comes out with a report in, in March, right, that accused Russia of, again, meddling to elect Trump in 2020. And they say that Kalinic was involved in meddling in 2020, including producing a documentary that he says, like, he has no idea what they're talking about. But anyway, they call him not a Russian intelligence officer. They don't say that he has ties to Russian intelligence. They use a a new term for him now. This is like the third term that he's gotten. They call him a Russian influence agent, Mm. which like, and Matt, like, like, you know, Russia better than me is Russia is influence agent. Is that a formal term or role inside of Russia? Do they have influence agents working for them? Like working for the government? It sounds a little bit like the description of Butina in 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 the in the indictment, where they were they had some kind of term of art that they were using to describe somebody who was like a spotter for real intelligence agents or something like that. Right. But, yes. Yes. Which of course right. they have no evidence of. Right. But right. they use the court filings to because again that's a case where they that's one of the few Russians they actually had in RussiaGate. They needed some Russians to make this thing look somewhat credible. So that's why I think Butina and Kalimnik were targeted. With Butina was put through hell, charged in a ridiculous case, and subjected to horrible conditions. Um, and I'm actually ashamed that I didn't say I didn't say more about it when it was happening. When she was being caged in the U.S. and treated so inhumanely, and being mocked in the U.S. media as a Russian honeypot who had come to seduce Americans into giving up secrets for Putin, all this crazy stuff, and. All these liberal media outlets are going along with that. I, I regret that I didn't say more about that. But a similar dynamic now with Kalimnik, where where's the evidence for any of this? You know, where's the evidence that he traveled to the U.S. on a, on a Russian diplomatic passport? Mueller also, when he uh, accused Manafort, Manafort was treated terribly, by the way. He might deserve it karmically, given his past, like he's got a horrible history representing some terrible dictators and whitewashing their crimes. He was like treated, he was indicted for like an accused of lying for not remembering things. He was put in really harsh solitary confinement. So at a certain point, Mueller accused Manafort of breaking their cooperation agreement. And that was used to fuel innuendo that Manafort was covering things up to protect Trump and hide the real collusion. And one of the things that Manafort was accused of lying about was meeting Kalimnik in Madrid. Mueller says that Kalimnik and Manafort met in Madrid in February 2017. Mueller also says that Manafort first denied this twice in the first two meetings. But ultimately, at some point, he caved and relented when they say that they gave him evidence that Kalimnik was in Madrid. Well, Madrid. Well, Kalimnik tells me that he's never been to Madrid in his life. 
and that the only possible evidence that they have is a flight booking that he made, which he later canceled. And they would have that because they took his emails, which, by the way, is another curious thing. They have his emails, yet we haven't seen very many of them in public exhibits and all that, which is very curious. I wonder why. But Mm -hmm. so Kalimic denies going to Madrid. Now, I can't take him at face value because, you know, like you just can't accept claims on faith. But it's important what he's doing. He's challenging something that the Mueller report is asserting. And we can't take their claims on faith either. And they're the ones making the allegation. So what is their evidence that that they went to Madrid? And I asked them if they have any evidence for it. I wrote Mueller and Weissman, of course, didn't get a response. But the Mueller report doesn't say what the evidence is. And I suspect it might just be that flight booking, in which case they would have gotten it wrong. Because as Klemek says, if I actually went to Madrid, they'd have it. They'd see the border crossing. They'd see an actual a flight ticket, you know, like a, him, his name on a passenger sheet. But there's none of that. So, yeah, I mean, again, that's, that's a case where, yeah. Yeah, in, in, a, in a functioning situation where we had a, 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 a news media that worked the way it would, was supposed to, you'd have everybody would be interviewing this guy. And the New York Times would also be doing the same interview. And they would come up with the same questions. Like, you know, what about he's saying he's got this passport. So what's and they would call Mueller and Weissman and all these people. And they would they would by virtue of being the New York Times and the Washington Post, they would be able to get an answer. And then we would get to the bottom of what's actually happening here. But because basically everybody ignores the story except you, (laughs) you know, we're we're not going to see this ball rolled forward and they're just going to continue to just say, you know, oh, okay, we've got it. You know, this is it. It's amazing. It's It's so funny. You can count on like two hands, the number of reporters who actually look at the facts of Russiagate. The vast majority, or in fact, the the entirety of uh, mainstream reporting and even on some liberal progressive sides as well, is just taking the bombshell assertion and parroting as if it's true and not looking at the underlying evidence and not looking at the facts. And it's it just continues. It never it never ends. Right. Like, no matter how many times they've been burned with all these bombshells that fail, it just keeps on going. And I just want to you know just to I wanted to say one thing about the polling data and these and this idea that they could have been used. Let's say there was some sweeping Russian interference operation aimed at brainwashing Americans, and somehow Americans could be convinced not to vote for Trump based on some ad on Facebook or Instagram. A couple of stats. This is from the Senate Intelligence Committee, which says that more ads targeted DC than Pennsylvania. A total of $1,979 was spent in Wisconsin. $1,925 of that was in the primary. So 79 minus 25, that's 50. So just $54 on Facebook ads Look, from Russia. That, that goes a long way with Facebook ads. The They're election, very effective. In Wisconsin. Yeah. In, Wisconsin. In, in Michigan and Pennsylvania, 800, uh, sorry, in, in Michigan and Pennsylvania, Eight hundred and twenty-three dollars and three hundred three hundred dollars, respectively, and more of the geographically targeted ads ran in two thousand fifteen than in twenty sixteen. And according to everybody, like Hillary Clinton, every host on MSNBC, every uh, Democrat in a major position in Congress, uh, you know, anonymous intelligence officials, this is the supposed sophisticated interference operation that Kalimnik was assisting. So if he did use somehow this polling data to give to Russia for their ads, obviously they didn't use it very well. Mm. Amazing. Well, uh, well done in, uh, yeah. in in reaching uh, the guy. I think that was a it, it was it was a real way of showing up uh, the RussiaGate press. Uh, you know, ac- excellent interview, and um, you know, I hope I hope somebody picks it up. And does something with it. And good luck in Syria, too. You yeah. know, uh, and we're looking forward to seeing when the work you come back with there. Thank you, guys. It's, uh, I really appreciate your support as always. And it's always great to be on. So thank you. All right. That was awesome. That was awesome. Yeah. Really great. Make we sure learned you, a lot. We learned so much. And you guys, Bursting thank you for knowledge. listening to list useful it is. Thank you for watching. Make sure you rate and review us on iTunes. Make sure you subscribe to youtube.com slash useful idiots. Make sure, of course, you subscribe to useful idiots.substack.com. Yeah, useful idiots.substack.com. Make sure that you use the hashtag useful idiots pod. Tell us about live events you want us to cover, live stream. 
you're definitely going to want to become supporters of uh, the Substack because paying supporters get so much. What do they get? From this week alone, you're going to get Aaron Mate talking about something very controversial. You're also going to get some I'm fourth just, wall shit. Some really good fourth wall shit. Larry David shit. Uh, Burger King shit. Joe Biden stuff. Some Maybe some Michelle Bachman stuff about retardation and um, the HPV vaccine. Michelle Bachman Turner Overdrive. Yeah, Michelle Bachman Turner Overdrive. I like that. The three t-shirt ideas we got from this episode are mental retardation thereafter, which we is, again, it's more of a band name. Asaz John Hancock. That could be more of a band, too. And smell the backpack. And um, to understand those last two, you're going to have to become uh, paying members of. Uh, right. Yeah. Thanks for listening, and we'll uh, we'll see you again next week. <laughs>